Thank you very much, Roberto. Any curiosities and uh, questions to Roberto and the other operators? Uh, after. after then. Yeah, let's so, let's go <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. We are tired. So, uh, we have uh, uh, two further presentation about environmental uh, side, uh, e-flow, eco-hydraulics, uh, and so on. So, Martina Bussettini is going on. Thank you, Martina. It won't be the... Okay, thank you. It won't be the final blow because there's another presentation later, but <laughs> I'll try to be quick and, uh, yeah, just step back from the flat um, events and flood uh, risk management and uh, have a look at the river processes as such. Uh, rivers, especially in Italy, they are very dynamic. And so, as you know, we have a huge diversity in uh, gradients in topography, in geology, climate, and very good conditions for human settlement. So, um, catchments are under pressure and they've been under pressure for a long time. And, of course, we have exploited our systems, and this is just one normal situation for us. So, this is the Magra River. It's a very dynamic river, subject to evulsion. Nevertheless, we, we like to live with it, um, as you can see. So, we have lots of this uh, situation, and at the same time, we have to cope with the achievement of different objectives of our policies. So, socioeconomic development, um, environmental protection, um, flood risk management, how do we do it? We have to know how the, our system work, and we have to do it by looking at them in space and time. So, um, during the last decades and last century, uh, our rivers underwent uh, severe incision and narrowing due to damming, due to sediment mining, to afforestation, and you can see how deep they, they go. And um, even if the pressures were removed, uh, still these incision processes are, are uh, going on. So um, it needs a lot of uh, effort to understand and to, to manage this. And you can see, for example, this is um, uh, uh, Piave River in the north of Italy. Um, the, the, the stages uh, it underwent until the 90s. And why uh, does the trend change? Because the legislation uh, prevented for sediment mining in rivers except for some uh, particular uh, occasions. So now there is a sort of aggradation, but we don't know up to uh, which point, because it depends on how we manage, how we implement measures. So we know why it happened, thanks to sound science. So as I said, we had dams, afforestation, gravel mining, so we had less sediment, and this led to incision, narrowing. You can see the nice pillars of the bridge there, and armoring of uh, the river uh, bed. And of course, uh, this increased the flood risk, but also put a lot of uh, impairment to ecosystems and the services they provide. So what's the extent of this alteration? How do we study them? We have to study them during time. Uh, you all know that um, there are different uh, pressures on control variables, uh, which are in, in practice uh, the uh, water and sediment discharges, and a river uh, change their morphology. They adapt to these uh, perturbations. And changing their morphology, they also change their conveyance and their hydrology, their hydraulics. So um, when we have a, um, an assessment of a current status, it's just a point along a trajectory. And we have to know what happened in the past and to uh, understand what will happen probably in the future. If we don't put uh, any measure in place or if we have some mitigation or restoration measures. But we also have to look at that in space, uh, especially now that um, all pressures are, are impairing uh, the systems in an intertwined and connected way. So um, we know that the controls and the pressures on these controls at the wider scales will impair the site-specific uh, geometry, like river sections and the habitats, uh, passing through the filters of uh, the geometry of the valleys, uh, the erosional uh, characteristics given by substrate and vegetation. And if this changes, of course, you will have challenges on management, but also on monitoring strategies. So um, uh, hydromorphological analysis is needed to, to inform our monitoring strategies, and a lot of information is needed, too. 
So um, as an example, having these very dynamic rivers that are subject to avulsion, avulsion uh, we need to know how they moved during the past, and, and this gives us uh, some uh, um, scenarios for the geometry, and this scenario in turn will uh, um, underpin the assumptions that we use for the monitoring and the modeling and also the boundary conditions for the modeling. And, and the same thing is for sediment connectivity. We have to study what happens in terms of uh, uh, sediment sources and the transfers of this sediment because, again, this is a scenario for our uh, assumptions and the models we use and, um, and all the consequent uh, conditions for the same models. And the same is uh, from the ecosystem protection side because we, we have to understand what happens uh, at the wider scales, uh, to understand what will happen in the habitat scale, um, namely the meso habitat scale, which is uh, uh, the more interesting to study the ecosystems. So we can follow um, through the mapping of the geomorphic units assemblage, what will happen to our um, river systems when um, the, their morphologies are impaired. And um, by mapping also the variation of uh, the assemblage of geomorphic units uh, with discharge, we can know uh, which are the best conditions uh, for communities of species and then derive this nice habitat flow rating curves and, and then uh, derive uh, the availability of habitat in time and space and in this way inform the strategies for river management and you know, to reach the environmental objectives. Uh, all these things we try to put all these things into a context, uh, a methodological framework for the analysis of our systems, uh, which is uh, um, now in, uh, in the Italian legislation. And, and it is basically an analysis in space and time in which we characterize our catchment uh, from the catchment to the rich scale, which is the most significant because it's homogeneous in, in the response of processes. Um, we, we assess the sediment connectivity, the sediment <laughs> dynamics, and then we see what happened in, uh, in time to understand the future trajectory and the current status of our rivers in terms of uh, flood hazard or ecosystem quality. And in this way, we can see how far we are from our objectives and put in place some uh, studies for scenarios and, uh, and inform the management. Uh, in this, we need a lot of information in time and at global scale and remote sensing has an enormous power to inform this, this kind of assessment and the monitoring. This is just a, a aerial imagery, but you can see how you can contextualize a local pressure given by sand mining and dams um, into a wider, in wider scale of uh, the diffuse consequences, so the adjustment of the channel over time. And as I said before, some processes were triggered by sediment mining, and although it sees they're still going on, but in a, in a better way now. Um, with, by remote sensing, we can map what happens in, in our rivers uh, in, a, in very um, reduced times and at a very wide scale. This is an example that was run in uh, Piemonte region. Uh, so we, we mapped all the region um, and we, we can have a, a lot of information characterizing the river, like basic uh, uh, parameters like slope and so on, but also all the riverscape classification and the geomorphic units and so on. And another, except I, I think, um, crucial application or very exceptional is uh, that we can analyze the rich connectivity in terms of sediment loads and, uh, and know what happens all over the catchment. And this is, uh, this, has an, this has an enormous value, not only for sediment budget, but to inform uh, development policies like, for example, uh, hydropower production. This is an application that we run in, uh, in a three years uh, Mekong region. And by running this uh, simple model uh, uh, fed by remote sensing information, uh, the guys at the Polytechnic of Milano were able to, um, to see how the hydropower production increased and at the same time the trapping rate uh, the related trapping, trapping rate uh, increases or decreases and to find scenarios, optimal scenarios to have hydropower development uh, and at the same time uh, a reduced uh, trapping rate which means uh, uh, less impairment to the systems in terms of ecology and in terms of flood risk management. So uh, I think and we think this is extremely powerful and um, 
a tremendous uh, opportunity because um, we have this information which is uh, um, frequently available, objective, uh, applicable at the large, large scale, and interpretable by semi-automatized procedures. Uh, it can support the large scale planning because it, it gives us uh, um, immediately uh, the regional pattern schemes and evolutionary trajectory, but also the local scale analysis of channel evolution and sediment connectivity. And, uh, it can be used to, to supplement, to support the ordinary, let's say, normal uh, monitoring strategies because it can highlight the bottlenecks, the critical spots where we can address more site-specific monitoring. And, and so we might have in this way, and I'm sure we will have in this way, cost-efficient uh, hydrological monitoring strategies and modeling. And as operational hydrology experts and workers, we can better benefit to this information cap capability, as I say, to get more fit-to-purpose, cost-efficient strategies. So um, we know what remote sensing could do for us in terms of our aerial uh, uh, photo imagery. Uh, there are nice publications. This is one by Simone Bizzi, developed inside a European project called Reform. And he is just listing for all the spatial units so what we can see and uh, we can assess by uh, remote sensing data. So there are all the references. The next challenge would be what remote sensing from satellite can do for us. And my colleague Barbara Belletti is going to tell us about it. Thank you very much.